Jeff Booth, welcome back to Real Vision. Thanks. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks for having me. There's a lot of people said, look, you and I need to have a chat. So I was really keen to get this um, out and done. And I thought this particular campaign that we're doing, which is has everything changed, I thought it's a perfect time to talk to you. Um, I think you and I share some similar views and I'd love to dig into that. Firstly, before we start all of that, just give everybody a bit of background about yourself and what you do. Um, and then we'll dig in a bit to your macro framework as well. Um, I, I'm a technology entrepreneur. So now many boards, co-founder of no, a number of technology companies and, and, and a reluctant author. Uh, so <laughs> so I, um, I wrote the, the book, The Price of Tomorrow, last year. Uh, and, and published it in January before all of this happened. You had me on your show, and 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 it it just it's playing out like a playbook of, the, of what I uh, talked about in the book. So give us a, a, a bit of a um, pricey of, of the book and the main concepts that you talked about within that. So so the idea behind the book is technology is uh, deflationary, or technology provides efficiency. Um, we, every single person who uses technology. Um, doesn't use it to increase their costs, both personally and and in businesses. We use it to reduce labor and to make things more efficient. The output of that efficiency is deflation. Um, and and so what what you have and and it's not just a little bit deflationary. People are looking at it through a rear view mirror. It's exponentially so because because uh, Moore's law and technology is exponential. And so it's. And I used an example in our last interview uh, where, where I folded a piece of paper 50 times, if I could fold it on itself 50 times. And, and most people don't recognize that on 50 folds, if you could fold a piece of paper 50 times, it would reach the sun. Um, and for the same reason that people don't re realize that it would reach the sun is the same reason we, we massively underestimate what's happening in technology. And so if that's true, if that thesis is true, then what that means is technology, which was a small driver to deflation, is now the most important driver. It's moving up and up and up. And it also means that we're likely to underestimate by how much. So now, now look to the other side to say, what evidence do we have to say how much are we missing it? And out of before COVID, out of $250 trillion in, in debt to run an $80 trillion global economy, $185 trillion has come in, of that new debt has come in the last uh, 20 years as this has happened. That's not, that's a problem. That's a, bad, a really big problem because it's just a giant debt bubble and creating mispricing and everything else. It's a giant problem, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is it's exponentially worse going forward. And that means to fill that hole, you have to ex have exponentially more debt until currencies break. And so, so economists are looking through a rear view lens of, and I, I, I fully respect demographics, everything else matters a lot. Um, it's, uh, so do supply chains, so do, so there's a whole bunch of other things. And, um, but the biggest impact in our future on this conversation by such a far stretch is what I'm talking about. And, our, and, our, and the economies aren't wired for it. So these two great forces are fighting each other. And all of the secondary effects, all of them, are because of those two forces fighting each other. So we then start with a huge economic... Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. All of them are because of those two forces fighting each other. So 
we then start with a huge economic event after you wrote the book. Yeah. Where does this now fit into your framework? My guess is it plays into it perfectly. Yeah, so all it does is it accelerates it. And, 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 and it, so I'm a technology entrepreneur. Oh, one, of my, one of the companies I co-founded was doing 200,000 a month last, uh, last year at this time. It's now doing eight and a half million dollars. It's, wow. it's, it's an acceleration of, uh, of technology everywhere. All of those companies. Why do you think technology is, is actually a store of value? Why, it's, why, why the top technology companies working on network effects are racing up in value? They, they might be too high priced, but a relative store of value. That's, the money is just injecting into where can I store value? And, and, and it's actually making it happen faster. So, so that you're, you're, and people aren't connecting the dots on, so on some of these things, if you think about, so, so fill a hole of commercial real estate with more debt, right? So to prevent the prices from, 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 from coming down. Yes, that might work, but people aren't in the offices that commercial, that, that commercial real estate shouldn't be priced where it is. Um, and they're on zoom. They're on, and maybe 50% are in the offices. That means commercial real estate has to fall by that. You, or logically, you would expect a, a reversion to the mean of, of something like that. But it's not just that. That's the first order consequence. The second order consequence is as people are working from home and all these businesses are saying, hey, it's okay to work from home, people are thinking that their labor isn't mobile, right? If I can hire the and they can work like from their home. Borders don't matter anymore. Um, I, I have a company in India um, with a hundred people building technology all over the the world. It's it, it's it's growing like weed. It's uh, so and you can and, and you can get great talent and everything else. So now there's further labor, um, further deflation in the labor rate. Right? And also, you know, one of the things I've spent a lot of time looking at recently is, you know, kind of artificial intelligence and mean machine learning. It replaces so many people. Now, forget about the singularity and, you know, all of that. But just at a basic level, tasks that take a lot of humans a lot of time just now disappear. I wrote in my book, and I, there's two chapters in my book on artificial intelligence. I'm really deep on this subject, and know many of the top researchers like I call are, are my friends. Very so, I, I, and how fast this is moving, and people are underestimating it by a, a quantum amount. <laughs> They're just staggering. You're right; it, it's moving that it's moving that fast, and just and and I think people have a, when when they look at that thesis, and what I say is. What is human intelligence, right? It's just error correction. What you're doing to a whole bunch of people, what we're doing on this and people listening to this are correcting errors. Maybe we're wrong um, and we, we build on top of knowledge and as we practice, we get better and better and better. And that practice takes us down. We can't do everything, right? We practice and we zone in and we miss bigger patterns because we're, we're practicing in a narrow asylum. That's actually all just computers do. It's, it's error correction at scale. And that error correction is building. And first of all, PhDs or humans are helping error correct. And over time, it's just error correction at scale. So it's logical to think at one point we will get to the singularity. But to, to the point that you just made, it's actually, people are looking at the end point and saying, okay, it's not deflationary until then. The jobs come out then. It, it's, like, it's like, it's not a light switch. It's exponentially more deflationary along that path. And, to, and one day we might get there, one day we might not. Um, I just, we're going we're gonna to get there. But that's an, it's, the, that argument is irrelevant to the point that it's deflationary. It creates way more efficiency. And, and here's the thing. That efficiency is a savings on our time. Why are we blocking that? Why, so, so if we block that, if we try to stop that, it, we won't stop it anyways. It's a way bigger force than, than money printing can be. And we can talk about what's going to, I, I think you and I agree on what's going to happen here. Um, but, uh, but by stopping it, we rob society of the game. And we force people 
to pay for prices that are artificially high, that were manipulated artificially high. We force people on a, on a treadmill. We force society on a treadmill to pay for those artificially high prices. And then, because we've broken the rules of capitalism and not let things fail, we, we, socialism rises because we have to pay a whole bunch of people more money because of a thing we created in the first place by trying to keep prices high. And society breaks, and it's all a waste of time. They can't. It can't. It, it can't solve it because you're 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 fighting nature. So how do you solve that? The issue of a slowly over time that rises exponentially, loss of the need of certain skills. Now the price of goods falling doesn't necessarily offset that if there's no income. So so but but but, but play that. So so again, people don't see. It's impossible to see an in interconnected system by looking at one part, right? And that's what people get confused about a lot. So people look at a one part and they'll say, okay, my house has to go up because that's my savings. And housing always goes up. Without asking, would housing have gone up without $185 trillion of stimulus over the last 20 years? And you know it wouldn't. You would see, it, it, so people think, oh no, it's just tech goods that are deflationary. <coughs> no, it, everything. It's the only thing that it's not is the things that we're manipulating higher in asset prices because, because of the, the monetary easing and the printing of money by warping capitalism. So what does, what does capitalism call for and free market call, call, uh, call for? Entrepreneurs racing in to make products or services that are better for us. And unless that, unless they win, and they fail, right? And what that means against technology is mean it means that all prices should be falling. And as technology moves into more and more industries, prices should be falling more and more. It's just that's the natural order of things. And how does that not yet go through to certain goods? Because, I mean, look, it's coming. Whether it's in farming, where Productivity has increased dramatically over time, although flattened out somewhat. I'm on. I'm on two chairman of two boards in in, in agriculture. It's coming fast. Yeah, it's coming fast. <laughs> and so there's that area. There's the the raw material inputs. I guess are the things where you get cyclical and sometimes secular um, price rises. And, and people confuse that with inflation because they're still looking back at the 1970s, and this is an entirely different world. And and without monetary easing and amount amount of credit that is being created, what would the price of those raw materials be if you let that natural market take over? Right, they would fall. Right, look at what happened in 2008 to the price of oil. Right, as people as you, as you as you printed, the price of oil just went straight up. Right, in real terms. It, it, you, you would see it everywhere. The capitalism would take its place. Clear. There's a thing, it, it, but here's where we're trapped. There's so much debt. The policy mistake was made a long, long time ago, right? And you know this, right? And so, uh, and and so, inst by decreasing interest rates instead of increasing interest rates and letting kind of a, a recession happen, we built bigger and bigger debt bubbles. And kept on in decreasing interest rates to the point that we're, we're trapped. So there's only two choices. There's choice one, um, and and in fact, there's only there is no good choices. Choice one is uh, is save currencies, let a uh, uh, let a depression happen, deflationary depression happen, asset prices correct by 85, 90 percent, um, everything falls. If you carry that on, banks fail, governments fail, the entire world goes into, uh, there's lineups like in the 30s for, it's, it's horrific on society because of something that happened over here that we're paying no attention to. But it's, so it's, I'm not arguing that we should do that, but now look at the alternative. The alternative is actually made probably more horrific for society. With it, and that's what we're doing. So governments are going to print, right? And and you know you know as well as I do, they can't create inflation until the rules change, right? So so right now more that that is 
is going into asset prices, inflation, and everything else. But the next thing will go MMT and fiscal response and everything else. And you, and once inflation starts, look at it will be hyperinflation. It, it, it might take some time, it, but and it might be, it, but currency after currency is going to fail. Um, and I think we share a similar view. U.S. might be the last standing, but uh, um, but currency after, but as currencies fail, the feedback effects of other currencies failing just becomes faster and faster because because trade changes, hot flows of money back and forth as you warp all sense of reality on on a market uh, on on markets, um, but. But how do you get out of it? How do you how do you stop it once it starts? And 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 I, and I think so. You've effectively taken out the Fed mandate and you've given it to Treasury, all around the world. Similar, uh, um, and now politicians are in charge of that. And do you remember when Volcker increased rates? So after the seventies, after gold reserve, uh, Volcker increased rates and to twenty plus and caused a massive recession. Businesses failed and everything else. That was against a debt that was not close to this. Government debt wasn't close to this. The Fed hadn't absorbed the risk of the government debt. So if you tried the same thing today, right? The government fails, the Fed fails. So, so once you start that cascade, if you raise interest rates against what's happening on the short-term bond, <laughs> right, you, you force it to happen fast and the entire thing blows up. So, so, so we have some real challenges ahead. No matter which pick, no, no matter which pick. The other part of that that I've focused on for a long time is I have this little moniker that says, "Debt plus deflation equals a ticket to bankruptcy," yeah. because real debts rise all the time. So in this environment where we've got a natural order of deflationary pressure over time, driven by technology, demographics, and a few other things, is it means the debt burden goes up. And so part of the answer to that is create more debt to service your debt. You know, we've seen that habit. What also interests me, I think people don't think through, to go back to the commodity price inflation is, and we've seen it every time, you raise, you double the cost of oil now, it is not inflationary, it's deflationary. Exactly. It's all spending because of this debt burden, yeah. all spending collapses. And people don't get it. They, they seem to think this is inflationary. It's going to feed on itself. There is no way to generate demand inflation in this economy in this structure. It's impossible. Exactly. It's impossible. So right now, that's why I said we agree. As you add more debt, it becomes more disinflationary. Right. It adds deflation to everything we're talking about as if you didn't need more, <laughs> more, uh, more pressure, deflationary pressure. And people talk about, oh, there's Jeff, the deflationary guy or, or this. All I'm, to, this is logic. This is first principles. This is understanding what, what is happening. If somebody says a train's coming and pushes you out of the way of the train, you know, it, like that's what's coming, right? <laughs> so, it, um, so we can talk about what the sol solutions look like and everything else, but there's no good solutions right now. Central banks have put themselves in a trap and, and we're all frogs boiling in a pot. Um, and, and the real the real risk, a lot of your listeners are, okay, where can I have safety of money? And you talk about, and I that you do a really good job of that in Bitcoin and, and others. I think it's a lifeboat away from uh, uh, what's happening here. So I am also irresponsibly long. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, um, but, um, hey, sorry, just people don't get that, by the way, because they say, but you're a deflationist. Surely it means Bitcoin goes down. I'm like, no. Yeah, because of the yeah. outcomes. Exactly, yeah. and and even if that your the real value of that will go up. If you, but the I would say beyond all of that, if you look at the history and the swinging pendulum of what ends up happening when we're in these cycles, it's 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 revolution. It's people in the street. If you're seeing what's happening in the U.S. and it's just those are glimmers of what's coming, right? And that's what that's why I wrote the book. I was hoping to have I wrote the book for my children so that uh, so that we could have intelligent dialogue about what must be done to get to the other side, because the vortex of yelling on both sides of the aisle when both sides, Republicans, Democrats, everything don't have a clue about what they're dealing with. 
Um, it's and uh, the central bank. They don't yeah, understand. Nor, nor, nor is it central bank. And if they, and even if they knew, how do they get out? We need some serious dialogue on that. Otherwise, society breaks. And so, when I think about Bitcoin, I think about, um, I think about a lifeboat. Right. And and uh, and and I hope it goes up slower than fast, so more people jump in the lifeboat. That's a, that, that's my hope. I'm not. I could care less about the money. I care about uh, I, I I care about um, safety. What uh, what happens to society and everything else. And and um, when when most people are failing, they rise up and look for and they blame others for that fa fa uh, failing. And so anytime you go through. Uh, uh, if you go through a uh, depression like we would have to go through, or you go through hyperinflation, look at societies that, that happens. You have, you, it's controlled by the biggest thug. Well, one of the other interesting things is for a long time, there was a, I don't know if you've ever seen it, James Goldsmith, the famous corporate raider and financier from the UK, um, and a pure capitalist, appeared on Charlie Rose, and it was all part of what he was doing at the time. The WTO agreement was under negotiation and James Goldsmith said, this is wrong. And everyone was like, but you're a free market capitalist with businesses all around the world. He said, you have no understanding what you're about to do. You're about to destroy society in 20 years time. And you're going to create a massive deflationary wave that makes it almost impossible to compete without moving all your labor abroad right. and you know, the rise of technology, et cetera. That whole thing has come to pass. And people now think, because humans are typical, they look back. Yeah. Let's undo globalization. I understand that there may be over-reliances and we want to trade, change trade linkages and supply chains. Okay, fine. But in the software age and the profundity of Mark Andreessen's comment of software is eating the world is still not understood by most people. They kind of think they get it, but it's as big a rabbit hole as Bitcoin is. And it's the rabbit hole that caused you to write an entire book about it is that everything is globalized in a software world. There is no, there are no borders. There's no, we're not going back to manufacturing steel in the United States because we don't care about steel any longer. We're using software, it, and, and 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 that software is it, 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 exactly it's digital. It's it, and, and you can sell everything on your phone. Why you use all, all the apps on your phone is they're free, right? It's it, and and it scales across the world for pennies instead of having to have control of supply chains to be able to to scale up. Um, it it's so different, but it's so foreign to what what people have seen their whole lives so i understand why they get trapped and so why so there is a there's a huge shit fight that goes on all day about the measurement of inflation so there's a whole group of people who will say my cost of living is going up how dare you talk about deflation and there's a whole group of people who will say this is the most deflationary thing we've ever seen and all i can see is deflation now because we don't put in cpi the value of all of these things that are free bingo Right, that's one thing, but CPI also doesn't measure healthcare costs accurately and other stuff. So, how people that understand some of this cost of living deflation versus product deflation frame some of that for people to think about. Well, that, that's what I would just because say. people that's are right. worse off. I mean, yeah. the, the poorer parts of society are much worse off. Well, so if you just well, let's start with this. The first thing I said. Is technology, if, does it create efficiency on an exponential scale? And the answer is yes. That's, I don't think anybody would argue with that. Then the output of that has to be deflationary, right? And it has to be. And if technology is doing that, it is moving so fast, entrepreneurs are taking advantage of, of that and driving that into society. And it's moving not just into your iPhone, it's moving into healthcare, education. I'll talk about education or healthcare if you want me to. And, and, and how big it's going to make a difference going forward, not back. Yeah, very interesting. Um, but uh, but if, you, uh, if you talk about that, then it's everywhere. And people think it's just in their, the only reason people think it's just in their phone 
is they're measuring um, um, the, the, all of the other goods are going up and because we're, we're arbitrarily making the other things more expensive by changing the real value of money. I've just come across another idea that I've never had before just talking to you. So, so we understand that the poorer sections of, let's call the US, the UK is similar, in fact, most of Europe as well, slightly less so because of the, the social state, are poorer. They see the price of goods rising. I'm not sure the price of goods are rising. I think their wages are deflating. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. So, so it's deflation that they're seeing, and they're seeing it as inflation because their purchasing power has been diminished by the lack of value per man hour that they now have in this new society. When, when you do this, that's my point, exactly. When you do this, you make labor compete. You have Essentially, why, why governments right now are, are racing to the bottom on their currencies is they're trying to make their labor more competitive and their labor not understand that they just got a decrease in wages, right? That's, that's what they're doing. That's what, what ends up happening because if you're in that country, you don't know because all your goods are priced in that same currency. You don't know you got a decrease in wages. And that's what's creating. And, and so here's a, in, in Canada where I am, but my, my, my lake house. Seven years ago, we tore down the old cabin on the lake house. And, but in the winter, we could only rent it for $600 a month. Um, about a block away, same, uh, same type of cabin now rents for $1,500 a month. So what that means is if somebody's wages hasn't gone up by two and a half times, they've got a, they've got a decrease in their wages. And so no wonder they're mad. No wonder they're, they're racing to uh, UBI and, 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 and socialism and saying this is, this is broken. But they don't know why it's broken. Fascinating to think that because essentially the printing of more currency even in the closed system like the United States where, you know, sure, uh, there's exports and imports, but, but basically you could survive on, on U.S. goods. Monetary printing essentially means, and technology means that people's wages go down in relative purchasing power. And it's not the demand of, it's not the demand of commodities that we had in the 70s from this massive baby boom generation driving up prices because wages followed suit. We had wage inflation. We've got wage deflation and nobody understands it because it's insidious and it happens over time. It's exactly, that's exactly. And that's what's boiling. That's why we're frogs in a pot boiling and we don't understand. We, and when, it, when, it, when I said you can't understand an, an interconnected system by looking at its component parts, all of those people, whether it's the, I buy a house and it goes up and I don't question it, it would it have gone up with $185 trillion of stimulus? People that are on the bottom of that ladder, that their wages are actually going down in real terms, and they don't know. They're, these are people looking at it from a component parts, and and I would a lot of your listeners too are looking at it in component parts, um, and that's why they get confused on this whole thing. The entire system. If you just go, I should I could have stopped my book at this. Technology is efficiency on an exponential scale, and that creates deflation, period. <laughs> Nothing else matters, right? If that's true, then the entire way we've built society around have, needing inflation is a bug in the system. It will not work. Nothing will work, right? We have to, we have to rebuild against a deflationary monetary policy, which Bitcoin will force, right? Um, and uh, yeah, but otherwise, otherwise the so world burns. Here's another question that comes across my mind: is by doing this, we are increasing productivity. We're kind of arbitraging it. That's what technology does. Why does pro productivity measurement not increase? <laughs> because we're masking it in the in the printing. The productivity is going straight up, but we're concentrating that productivity and wealth in all of the technology companies we're, 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 uh, hands. That's what that's what we're, we're doing. What do you think's happening at Apple? What do you think's happening at Amazon? What do you think's happening at uh, many of the companies that I'm sitting on the boards of and what what's happening? You drive now have your have anyone who listens just look up network effects and what drives what 
what drives that. Network effect is network effects are responsible for about seventy percent of the value of these companies we're talking about, um, and and you concentrate it faster because you you stop capitalism from working. So you you're constant you're concentrating that inequality faster. It's been an extraordinary time since post COVID. It's it's ultra accelerated. If you know, I look at the shares of the triple B rated massive indebted companies, the AT and T's, the General Electrics, the Fords, the GMs, and they're going down. Right. Well, all the technology, who are all free cash flow, no debt, are doing right. the opposite. Yeah. And 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 it, it's again. Um, where do you think the AI researchers are going? Right? Where are the top AI researchers? If you looked at where that, because those companies have the ability to pay extraordinary to get the best talent, and and it, and again, that it concentrates. It concentrates on the network effect, and it makes it stronger and stronger and uh, 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 throughout time. So, and then the AI takes over, and the, then you don't need the same labor to do the same thing. So, uh, so, so the efficiency is there. It just removed labor and it's all and we're pushing it to the top tech companies. So then to go back to the big issue then, OK, we've identified I'm going to go back to some of these industries you talked about in a bit because I want to dig into that. But you've identified the fact that, OK, wages are deflating. It's almost impossible to get out of the way of this deflationary wave and we're not benefiting because our wages, well, some people's wages if you work for Google, your wages are inflating faster. Yeah, or 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 if you or if you've taken your money and you put it into assets that are, are inflating faster, or if you own most of the stocks that are going up. So that's right. actually why that it's driving the wealth inequality at a rate that is unmatched in history. So, so how does that get solved for the for the average person who doesn't who's not in control? I mean, clearly Bitcoin is one way. It gives you an anchor onto something else. Yeah. What else? What else can be done here while this plays out? It's the only way. Um, unfortunately, it's the only way. Today, today, there is going to be. A, so, if you think about what asset prices, let's connect the dots on a bunch of these. If you believe that governments aren't going to go in a deflationary spiral, which I, the probabilities are very low. They could make policy mistakes and it could get away on them before, um, but the probabilities are very low. That they allow that to happen, so you can expect more printing all over the world. Yeah. In the more in the more printing, you can expect housing prices to keep going up, stock prices to keep going up, and maybe not in real terms. If you look at the next step, why didn't people in Nazi Germany leave? Why didn't well the wealthy leave? Right. And and you could see it coming for years. If uh, you uh, so so if you look throughout history. And, and, or Venezuela or Turkey today, why don't they leave? Because what ends up happening is all of their wealth is denominated in that currency, their real estate, their stocks, their gain, everything. And leaving is leaving as a refugee. And back in, back in those times, even leaving as a refugee, you try to sell gold into your clothes and then the ship goes down and you sink to the bottom and everything else. And we see that throughout history, but, but it's because you long for better times looking backwards and you're actually because you have the assets you're sitting in that in that as the as the fires are burning and you don't know when to and you can't get out right your assets are going up you're actually enriching yourself as others are getting poor but you don't see the break to society happening and by the time you get out you can't get out or by the time you want to get out you can't get out and so that's a lot of people today are in that boat, right? Think they're, they're, and a lot of people on the, on the wealthy side are in that boat. They're sitting there thinking, wow, this is not a bad thing. Not looking at the consequence of why their asset prices and everything's rising so fast and not looking at most tons of the population doesn't have that privilege. And so you can expect if this printing continues that society to get worse and then get locked up in that currency, get locked up, and then there becomes capital controls, you can't get your money out and everything else, and it becomes really, ugly. history shows it over and over and over again, and we have evidence of this right now, right? We have, it, look at Hong Kong right now. 
um, look, look, and, and so you start to get some of uh, some of this. Bitcoin is an escape hatch. It's a safety. It's, it's, it's also a, what, what what is interesting to me about Bitcoin. It started from the ground up, from the yeah. little guy. Totally. It, it was not started by the big wealth. They owned gold and they owned property, but they didn't own this. And this right. is the one thing that little guy can get. And the genius of being able to stack sats, as they call it, of just <laughs> buying stuff, buying some, because it's affordable because it breaks down to small component parts. And it's so broad, it's available to anybody. Well, anything else, you know, if we were to say, oh, yeah, well, obviously Manhattan apartments, well, especially luxury apartments, they don't go down much. Great. You need 20 million bucks to do that. Exactly. But here's something you need a dollar for. Yeah. And that's, it, it, that, that's the thing. And it works on a network effect. And the more people, the more people that trust it, the more, uh, the, the more people that trust it. And it, it builds on itself and it builds on its, uh, itself. It's a beautifully designed uh, protocol. Be uh, there's a beautiful, uh, beautiful design, and and it plays on all of the things I talk about. It, I talk about Bitcoin a tiny bit in the book. Most of the book sets up for why that thing is going to be so incredible, because if you looked at, at this through for a first principles lens, you know where it's going. It, it, it here's a roadmap for where everything is, is going, and that um, I looked at the the interview we did I did with Max on on, on Real Vision in January. And there's a bunch of comments that says this aged like a fine wine, right? And uh, and 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 it's because if you understand what's happening in the overall system and what must happen from policies or or what is probabilities of in, uh, policy response. You know what's going to happen next, and you know what's going to happen after that, and you know what's going to happen after that. I mean, that, as far as I see it, there's one reaction function, which is printing more money. It's the only thing that they can do. Yeah. Now, even MMT, yes, you might be able to increase generalized productivity in the United States by implementing the right thing, but in the end, you're still devaluing your currency to do it. And that's a hell of a trade-off, and it's unlikely to yeah. work. And again, when yeah. I talk about devaluing the currency, I don't mean in relative terms to others. I mean the whole fiat currency system because everybody's doing the same thing. Yeah, but but let's just take MMT. So what we're really doing. So MMT is a response by governments to from breaking capitalism's rules, right? A whole bunch of people losing out that can't pay for their bills. I, I forced out, I forced prices up. There's a whole bunch of people that can't pay for housing and or medical or food and everything else. And then, and then they come back to the same government who manipulated prices higher in the first place and say, I need something so I can manipulate prices higher in the that, that you created in the first place. It's a response. So, so it's crazy to me that you're going to jump on MMT on top of this whole thing, but it's going to happen, right? It is, it is logical that at some point, because the Fed can't create inflation, for the same reasons you and I talked about, um, so it has to be uh, it has to be something like that, and you put politicians in control. But once you do, look out! You're gonna it's a path to hyperinflation, um, and 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 all currency is failing. That's what's going that that path is going to happen. And there's this there's this belief that oh, don't worry, will event the politicians will now increase interest rates and cause a depression, right? <laughs> So we didn't do it over here when the problem when the fire was smaller, right? We didn't do it when the fire was really small because we can grow out of this forever by printing more debt. Now that now we could create this massive fire, um, we'll do it over here when the fire is as big as the sun, right? It's just it's just ridiculous. It's not going to happen. Right. I'm going to ask. I want to go through some industries. Um, a few people have asked about. Agriculture. You mentioned to it. You've got some experience in it. I want to talk about agriculture, health, healthcare, and education. But let's let's tackle agriculture. Talk to me about deflation in agriculture. Because again, there's a lot of people who's like, well, the dollar's going down, or I think there's inflation coming. I want to buy agricultural stuff. And I'm like, look at the trend over the last 50 years. It's just gone down. Yeah. Um, and if you look at you know productivity went up and up and up from crops over time. W what is your view on this? What do you say? Okay. So. So I'm chairman of a board called Cubic Farms, um, and 
the, the company actually shouldn't be public now. It's public on the uh, TSXV stock exchange and it went public too, uh, too early. But I joined as chairman because of the innovation is so staggering and, um, and, what's, uh, and, and, and what's happening. And I can't give what's happening kind of public information. But what I would say is in a backdrop, what is, what is agriculture today? You have, you have these long supply chains Right, that are that actually are more fragile with weather dependencies, pesticides, everything else. But the, su the supply chains work because of the distribution function to large to retail, everything else, and and so it's really hard to break that. Almost like Walmart was a re or Sears or anything else. It's actually the supply chain that makes it efficient, and then all of the labor comes into the farm and everything else, and you grow these giant tracts of far far farmland and everything else. Um, but you build fragility into the system, right? And and then you have weather events and crop failures and everything else, and there's more fragility into the system and, and margins go down on the far farm. This, uh, they call it ag anywhere, and they've built these effectively containers that, that have undulating paths that grow 10 to 100 times more product, uh, 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 like per, footprint in, into this, no pesticides, any, anything else. And they're commercial scale ag units. And you can put them together and you could do lettuce or this and this. You could put how many you want together. In other words, you so can you're making distributed agriculture. You can localize that agriculture. So instead of looking like uh, um, a large supply chain, which requires, and, and in, in, a, in a world where things are breaking, governments are breaking all over, food matters a lot. Right, food matters. Well, so here, here's another thing for you to put into that equation. About a hundred years ago, there were something like 1,200 varieties of wheat. There are now seven on a commercial scale globally. Yeah. So what you've created is a huge fragility. Now, if you look at where the wheat's produced, it's basically the U.S., Canada, Australia, and Russia and Ukraine. That's it. Right. Yeah. Any. And we've just gone through a pandemic now. And people cannot get their heads around the fact that you can basically destroy all wheat with one blight. Yeah. And there's nothing we can do about it yeah. if Monsanto didn't figure it out in advance. Yeah, but even Monsanto. So, and, and then we eat that wheat with, with, with pesticides we know are terrible for us, right? Yeah. Um, and it's in all of these other food. And we have to because they're, it's, the, the bugs are resi resistant. That's actually, I'm chairman of another board, a private company called Terramera that makes ag inputs, essentially reduces pesticides by making ag inputs 10 times, uh, 10 times more effective. So you need one tenth the amount of, uh, of pesticide or, or what pesticide to make the, the yield better, or it drives natural inputs 10 times more effective and makes them able to be cost effective with with uh, with pesticides so so these changes dramatically have downstream uh, effects on cost of everything so when you when you're changing the function by 10 times right <laughs> and the number uh, one of the big cost inputs for farmers is pesticides and, and crop failure and everything else and you reduce that by the the the, the the downstream effects to, to some of these innovations, um, it's staggering, right? So it's more deflationary. That's it. That's one industry. But one I'd like to pick on is, is education, right? Um, what is, um, so today, um, universities are really real estate plays, right? Where, 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 and they get away with it because more people, top people go there, more people go there, top, top researchers go there so they can attract um, more, more talent. But what's valuable in the education? And I would say it's, it looks exactly the same as bookstores thinking they could compete against Amazon, right? It's, it's the information and, and what's going to happen here. Google just did it three weeks ago. Where they where they launched a program where a six month program for I think it's four hundred dollars that they'll hire over a four year degree, right? Because 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 when you understand what's what can happen, um, you can that you can digitize that same content and 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 sell it for 
exactly what Google did for nothing or almost anything in their content. And with that, you can get, drive all the best professors. I mean, isn't, isn't that what Real Vision is? Yeah, that's ex exactly. It's basically applied learning at scale from the best, smartest people in the world that you'd never get access to. It would have been prohibitive ever to do it in any other way. And now basically it's, you know, it's bordering on free. It's so cheap for what you get. It to to and actually, if you think about that, that, that what, what you're saying is content everywhere is free, right? You could get uh, or bordering on free. And or or for pennies or like what you charge for real vision for the value is staggering, right? Yeah. For that for that type of content, why can you do that? Because you can digitize that content and it can play on for years and years and years, um, and you can charge people a penny um, across the world and it distributes everywhere. And instead of having to go and learn in a thirty person classroom, right? That's the that, that's the difference. And by the way, with technology where it's going. I saw a demo of a product that uh, that blew me away um, just recently. That makes this Zoom call like it's it, we could put other people in the room and it feels like we're in the room, and I could whisper just to you, um, and the other people couldn't hear it. Um, so it's like so so again, people underestimate where technology is going because they're looking at where we are now, not even where it's actually really is now. They're looking at both where it's where they're looking backwards and it's moving so fast and these technology innovations are just uh, it's, it's staggering what it does to to the change and and why businesses don't understand it or or existing infrastructure doesn't understand it is for the same reason blockbuster didn't understand netflix the entire business model is framed around a different thing and when download speeds change good night i mean so, I mean, at Real Vision, you know, we've made no secret of the fact that education is going to be a big part of where we're going as well. There is no reason we can't create our own university. Now, if you think of two of the big inputs that we talked about in traditional CPI or, or just the cost of living for people, they've been monopolies or, or oligopolies. Education, you can only go to a certain number of providers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's going to go entirely because people like us can walk in offer a better product at a fraction of the price. So as we move out towards something of that sort, it becomes a, it, it becomes a huge change um, and it becomes massively deflationary because yeah. what happens is entrepreneurs look for excess profits and try and exploit them yeah. <laughs> until so many people come in and then the excess profits go away and the super normal profits go and you end up with a normal margin, right? SaaS still has like 70% profit margins. Um, and so that means it can destroy every business model until it gets destroyed itself by competition. So the overall amount of, of uh, margin goes down, but that's, we're nowhere near that yet. No, nowhere near that yet. So, so it encourages every entrepreneur to put their money into something that generates SaaS-like revenues. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 then, and then those get taken over time as more entrepreneurs come in to compete. And that's the, kind of the natural evolution of things. Um, the prices should be going down. Now, talk a bit about healthcare. I mean, I've witnessed a lot of some of this by what's going on in India, where there's a lot of cutting edge changes to healthcare um, in terms of robots, having physicians in different countries, yeah. all sorts of stuff. Talk, what, what are you seeing there? Where's healthcare going in all of this? Because right now, this is a typical oligopoly where they're clinging on to power, keeping up the price of pharmaceuticals, keeping up the price of operations, et cetera, but it feels like it's a house of cards. It, it, it is, and that's why it'll it, uh, be innovated away as well. But let's let's look at healthcare through the lens of data and AI, right? And let's look at why drugs cost what they cost, um, just that aspect. Drugs cost what they cost because, because to, to invent a drug, the amount of science that need, needed and then trials and trials and trials what you're doing is testing people in small batches and then ever bigger trials over over years to see what effects are going to what side effects and, and is a drug effect effective you're doing trials think about that from a day and, and why do you have to do that you have to do that because route your gut biome is different than mine so is what you eat so is your genetic code 
so is how you exercise, so is where you live. And all of these things, if you looked at yourself as a data, data system, it's just data, right? And what you're doing is you're taking humans and you're saying, I can figure out all, all, all this. And you have to, and, and there's no way to do it because all these things, your, your genomic, uh, genome against something else, against something else, this staggering combinatorial problem is too hard for people to figure out. So they think they can and they do it in small trials and they only see a tiny bit of the picture. And then after 10 or 20 years of these trials, you launch it to a wider audience who shows up differently and, there's, and the drug fails or it has tremendous bad side consequences. All that cost is embedded into our system today. AI changes that dramatically. It sees these things, it does all these tests, and as you have more data into the system, it, I, I, I say in a bunch of the AI conferences, why is Google, why, why is Google as big as it is? Why is, uh, why is Amazon as big as it is? There is no second best algorithm. The best algorithm wins, right? And, 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 and it consolidates data, and, and as it consolidates data, more data rushes in because the outcomes are so much better. And it, and, it, and it keeps on going. And then healthcare is going to look the same thing. So right now, people are, all of these silos of information are in silos. And there's different researchers in every different silo um, thinking that their silo is the most important, right? As you look across silo and you put some of these data sets together, um, this watch knows more about me than my doctor. It's now, uh, it's now knows my uh, my heart rate all times. It knows how much I exercise. It knows how much I sleep. It knows my it, like it, it knows more about me than my doctor. And it's it's native. It's getting more and more. So if I, if Apple said and I trust the privacy of their network, hey Jeff, send me your genome sequence, or we're going to give you a test to be able to do genome sequence, and we can make your outcomes ten times, hundred times better. If I trusted them with the da data. Um, uh, um, I would do it, right? You know, it's the same reason I use the watch in the first place because it gives me value, right? And there's nothing governments can do to stop it. It's coming. And that radically changes healthcare. Now, that's still a, a long time out. You're going to see uh, the, these, these, these things change. But if you say, if you think about US and some of the other, other regions, imagine what's happening in China. Um, they don't have to ask. Right? I've, I've, I've long asked, argued about the impact of big data on science, particularly medicine, because if you think of how we discovered cholera, it was what was done was to create the right hypothesis. That's the hard thing about science, yeah. right? Because you create lots of wrong hypotheses, it takes a lot of testing and you waste a lot of time. But with cholera, the genius who found cholera in London, there was all these ideas, it's airborne, it's this, it's that. And he mapped out London right. and mocked at the incidences and went to each spot and realized that each spot happened to have a water supply. And then he realized that some water supplies came from the Thames and others didn't. And therefore, those two differences were probably where the issue lay. We know that so much of human illness is driven by factors of yet which we do not understand. And we tend to do it in lab conditions as opposed to in AI massive data set conditions. Yeah. The more you put this stuff into massive data set conditions, the more you will find the answers much faster. Yeah, and we're it, not doing that yet. So AI sees things that we don't see. Like right. that's, and and, and it, it's understandable because we run out of time in our brains to be able to do the combinatorial as you as you have trillions of combinations. <laughs> You can't do it in your mind, and you, there's no way. You, so you have to take shortcuts, right? You, it, it's a, it, humans have to take shortcuts to be able to. And then we have a whole bunch of biases on top of those shortcuts that we think we were, were right and everything else. And only in time we realize it was a, a, a bias. It's how the human brain works. Um, the computers don't don't suffer from that. They keep on. And, and actually, if you saw what's happening today in some of these sectors uh, in AI in uh, how fast it's moving. It isn't 
what the scale we're talking about yet, but it's making dramatic differences in cancer prevention and some of those things that um, it, it, dramatic. It's mo it's moving really fast. Fascinating. Right, I'm going to ask you, we've been going an hour actually, I could get, talk for hours, but I've got a bunch of questions from our uh, members, so I thought I'd ask some of these because they're always keen to have them. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, there's a bunch of gold Bitcoin-y ones. <laughs> so why is Bitcoin and gold for that matter completely correlated with the US equities? The US dollar seems to offer a much better hedge against equity weakness. Maybe the dollar isn't so bad after all. So I think there's a bit about kind of gold and Bitcoin, just a bit more explanation over that. I think the correlation between equities you explained, which is like the printing of money is driving all of them. Driving all of them. I expect that that correlation to break and Bitcoin to be uh, at some at some point to be to to way to the upside, the way to the upside. Um, but uh, but the correlation is caused by all the printing. And so if you um, on a on a different show, if actually the day before Bitcoin fell a little bit and all equities sold off, I, I said, L listen, if there's not more stimulus, you can expect equities to fall. Right. Eventually, if you do, if there's no more stimulus, equities would fall by 80 percent. Right. The um, it, you would have a deflationary depression. And in that event, Bitcoin would probably fall short term, too. Right. Yeah, and I've always said it's a it's a passing correlation because right. of the network effects and everything else that's going on in it. Bingo. It's a much bigger thing. Bingo. Okay, more questions. Um, is uh, this is actually a good question because of what you've talked about? There's tech is this huge thing that's going on, and software's eating the world, and all the things we're talking about. But is it overvalued? What does overvalue mean? In, in, so in, 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 that's the thing. In today, all you're looking at, everything's overvalued, right? In the natural world, if you just said there was no printing, there's it, it, first, is is $185 trillion of debt, additional debt in the last 20 years. Is, that, is there a possibility to pay back that debt? Answer is no, right? So it, what it says is without that, what would be the real value? The debt right now is we're gonna we're gonna try to inflate it away, and that's going to there. Where is value? Like today, it's relative value right now. Where is free market telling you where there's uh, there is but no? The, free market? But the problem is, is if we say okay, the government's going to keep printing, therefore keep owning equities, but that's not necessarily the case because equities. The, well. I mean, they have a significant downside risk within them as embedded as well. They don't necessarily have to outperform in this situation. Yeah, but but if you looked at equities in Venezuela in the currency, yes, yeah, right. So that's and that's what's fooling people, right? And so that's actually why I'm a irresponsibly long Bitcoin because because it fools people to think they'll always go up, and they get caught into that trap. It's really the currency going down. Right? So they, I. I, def I, I looked at all asset classes in the denominator of the G4 central bank balance sheets. Fascinating. Uh, gold, be... gold underperformed by 50%. So huh. it didn't offset it. Um, most things didn't do particularly well. Equities over time haven't done well, but in periods of fast, rapid printing have done okay. Yeah. There's only one asset I could find anywhere in the world that has massively outperformed, yet it's correlated, which is yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, fascinating. Really fascinating, really fascinating. Uh, right. Um, I think, yeah, this is a question I'd like to hear as well. Is UBI, universal basic income, necessary in this transition period where we we haven't got to a new place yet. You can't give everybody Bitcoin. Not everybody's going to get them. So does it help? So I th I think... Or, or maybe the other way of saying it is also a welfare state because Europe is... Well, Europe will probably try both, but welfare states have some of those benefits as well. So so capitalism itself is the best. So what is capitalism? Free market capitalism. It, it's where entrepreneurs race in to try to create value for you. Um, if it works, 
it prices it prices you get value and and that's and and, and the entrepreneur if it doesn't the entrepreneur goes broke so does the debt against the entrepreneur everything else that's what it looks like but because we are not all equal capitalism values different people at different times and everything everything else you have it's a it's a really fine line and you do need kind of checks and balances to stop that from going out of control so i am a free market capitalist absolutely it's the best system but it's but it's a it's a delicate balance and once you once you start manipulating it you reinforce it and you and, and that's where we are today so you have these massive reinforcement things that, is, that are creating problems all over the world um i didn't answer the question yet right i believe that if you added ubi right now without looking at the the thing that's mat that matters you blow up the whole system faster right the whole system i think you need a, a total rewrite of how things look around the world right and then and then what end up, ends up happening is you probably need some sort of social safety net and checks and balances on capitalism that's what I uh, that's that's what I believe, and that social safety net might look like UBI. I I hate calling it UBI right now because because it just says, yep, let's go UBI right now on top of this broken system, and it'll the broken system will make it uh, it's going to be way worse. But do do I think we should let the whole thing fail and put people on the street and everything else? No, uh, no, I don't too. And 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 we have we don't have good options going forward. I suspect as Bitcoin grows, right, and it, the same thing is going to happen to govern as governments. All flows of capital. Um, if you think about, I could get a golden visa to Portugal right now for my family for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and there's a whole bunch of people. So where should I go and everything else? As as countries compete for capital, right? Happens. This happens right now. Happens all over the world right now. And and and, and you move because safety functioning society and everything else i suspect that's going to happen on bitcoin and i suspect the people that own bitcoin are going to be able to help write the rules for what that looks like because countries are going to be begging them to move and everything else and they will move to safe havens to that that, that also have some sort of social safety net so society functions mm. I mean, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons it's no coincidence I ended up in the Cayman Islands and it wasn't, it was for, I kind of knew where the world was going and I wanted to be in a place where it's not perfect. There's some fragilities based here, but for these reasons, it made sense to me, but also they're also very much looking at the whole kind of digital asset space. And what does it mean for a country like this? You know, what is its strategic advantage? There was a paper I tweeted out earlier today, Europe is starting to move very fast down this route. I think everybody's realizing it is a competition. It's going to be and, fun. and you can try and fight it. And there's a question here about government regulation, but the regulation is going the opposite way because they will lose people and capital if they don't. Well, that's the thing. So some will close it down. Some will close it. But because it's a, it's a distributed network, it can't be closed down everywhere. And the, when, when they, the, and game theory, as some governments closed it, it closed down, they actually create more value for other governments to to accept it, and so 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 you that's that's exactly why that the people if you just carry that forward, the people that are owning Bitcoin have a good chance to actually contribute to the new rules of how things should function in society. It's and yeah, and it's that people don't get their heads around the fact this is not a corporation. There's nobody to send a legal notice to. That's right. <laughs> Nothing you can do. Nothing. I can move, be in a different country, get on a plane, and I can use my Bitcoin, even though you've banned it there. I mean, it is almost impossible. It's a virus. Yeah. And viruses are incredibly difficult to destroy. Yeah. So you, I, I don't think you're going to, uh, you, there's no way to shut it down. I think it's going to grow. It's going to grow on the network effect. People are going to realize wow, um, why do I trust a piece of paper? that I know is being manipulated? Ask that question, right? Why do I trust that? So implicitly, I trust the, the, the a piece of paper that I know I, I know is being manipulated. 
and I don't trust this thing that I know can't be manipulated, right? Over time, people are going to realize, huh? So final question is why does the, why the hell does the Fed not understand this? Or are they too deep in the game that they can't even do anything about it anyway? So they might as well perpetuate the old game. What's the final thoughts on the Fed and where this is? I think they understand this. I, I don't think they understand how fast this is coming. But, it, but, but it's the same reason I, I had said that fold 50 takes you to the, to the sun. I think in the same reason why blockbuster management aren't bad people, right, is once they miss the path, and it's moved so fast, there's nothing they can do. So right now we have two really bad choices. And, and, and because of because short-term thinking and, pol and pol political circles, we're leaning into making it worse and, be and being disingenuous with the population through that. And that disingen and, and being disingenuous is causing hate on both sides. And so, and so, Again, that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book that it, it's you're not going to stop gravity. This is half of this is going to happen anyways. And it and I I look at the Fed like I would look at and I look at a lot of people in the system as not bad people. Some are, but I look at uh, um, but I look at them as the executives at Kodak, the executives at Blockbuster, the executives at Barnes and Noble, not understanding how fast technology was moving. And thinking they could stop it, and like Barnes Noble by putting coffee aisles in their stores because people love the uh, convenience of shopping at my for books in my store, right? So, so it's the same thing, and 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 so it's not bad people. It's they're stuck in a system, an interconnected system that they don't know how fast the rules just changed, and it's and and so they're trying to drive that old system on its last breaths harder and harder and harder with with their old tools and it's not working i mean it's incredible to me that the fed have not fully embraced an understanding of behavioral economics because now with huge data sets and the ability to use ai we can understand incentive systems across whole economic structures fed aren't even anywhere on any of this stuff they're still thinking that putting interest rates up up and down oh, is right. what is what is how you create incentive systems i mean this is like madness madness it's I mean, so it's the so whole computer far. gaming industry figured this out years ago. You can do anything by using the right incentive systems. It's all behavioral economics. It, it, exactly. In fact, uh, I wrote about it in the book as well. Um, it, the the science of how our brains work and behavioral economics has been so it's moved so much right now that it's embedded into the products we use every time, all the time. That's actually why the products become so addictive. Every, that's why your iPhone is addictive. That's why that, that's why the things you use are so addictive because it's been embedded into making it addictive, into into the product design of the technology. And, and here's the thing: I do this. I do this for a living. I know how how fast this uh, is moving, and I know it on all these different tangents. What you can do to be able to drive that. Fascinating. Jeff, really, really great conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Giving me a lot to think about, and I hope it's given other people a lot to think about as well. Because, you know, what I really like about how you've brought new knowledge to old discussions is, you've said, yeah, you're you're all talking about this thing over here, but you're actually missing what is probably the much bigger thing. And I think most people are. I, I think people don't understand it. They don't even understand what inflation is. I don't think they understand this rise of technology and how it's changing everything and that the system is just not even set up to deal with it. I mean, it's just, it's just, just no way. And, and, you know, it's sad, but there is one option. And, you know, I didn't set you up for that. I had no idea that you like Bitcoin, but it was just like, it's the only thing I could see that makes real sense right. as a way to, as you said, opt out. When I, and you said, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the lifeboat. When I first got into Bitcoin, I presented to global macro investor people back in 2011. Um, no, this was 2013 when I did this presentation. And I said, okay, the world's pretty fucked. We need a lifeboat. <laughs> and, I, and I create this cartoon of a lifeboat in graphic imagery and loaded some things onto it, of which Bitcoin was the first thing I loaded in and said, you need to row away because everything is changing, you know. I, you know. Like one of the reasons I'm here is tax regimes across the world, because the other 
function of what's going on is taxes will go up right for everybody right right that's coming there's nothing going to change that now um and so it's all of these big things that that they're all coming um and people just need to open their eyes to it and then take action early you do a really good job and your show does a really good job of grabbing some some incredible people and and teaching that to an, an audience so 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 a huge thanks to you huge thanks to max your editor who brought me on when i first wrote, wrote the book and so you make a difference and you're going to make a difference about people having a lifeboat right and 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 and, and what's happening so uh, so I appreciate what you do here too thank you brilliant jeff great to speak to you and i'm sure we'll get you on again okay without, there's so many topics to talk about thank you for watching this interview this is just a taste of what we do at real vision to learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.